Hey everybody, how are you guys all doing this evening or afternoon? Well, yeah, it's all evening for you guys. It's late afternoon for us. Um, someone had asked how the weather here is in Southern California. It's actually great. It's probably mm, 78 degrees today, super low humidity, so no wind, nice and sunny. So spring is here officially. It's it's getting uh, definitely getting um, nicer outside. So I'm not looking forward to the crazy hot summer that we got coming. It's kind of funny because my wife was just telling me how she wanted it to be nice and hot. And I didn't really like that comment too much because even though I do like the extra work we get in the summertime, it's just, you know, you guys know it gets hot and ridiculous. So forgive my little sunburn I got going on, too. So, um yeah, thanks, bud. Uh, yeah, I shaved my head today, so that's why you see it's sunburn on my forehead, but not on my head. So my hair was getting kind of long, so it was that time. So um, got a couple things, uh, a couple questions that I already kind of have set up on a you know piece of paper and got a couple topics I want to cover, and then I will try and get to any questions in the chat. So if you guys remember from the last one, if you guys could really, really please... Um, uh, questions to me, if you could put them in caps lock, okay, that would really, really help because that helps myself and Justin, the moderator, to make sure that we get to your guys' questions. So that's my goal is I want to try to get, excuse me, to more and more of you guys' questions and be able to answer them more. But also, you know, I got to cover the few things I want to cover too. So it is what it is, right? All right. So um, I uploaded a video today and I wanted to kind of correct a few things. You know, someone, uh, I had a few people point out some things about the video that I uploaded today about the uh, bad compressor that had the uh, suction valve that um, I said was bad in the compressor. And I, you know, the semantics, some people kind of, I wouldn't say attacked me, but had a hard time with the way that I worded that. And it had bad valves. Okay. It wasn't just a weak suction valve. It had a bad discharge valve and technically it's the little reed inside the compressor, but I use the term valves pretty loosely. Okay. The compressor was trash. Basically the valves inside the compressor, the high pressure was bypassing into the low pressure when the system was pumped down. Okay. So that was a problem. So that meant that we had a weak reed and the high pressure was getting past that reed and feeding into the low side of the compressor. So Again, just some of those semantics that people just got to make sure. But I also want to make sure that I'm correct when I say things to you guys so that way you understand. I know a lot of people know what I'm talking about, but then there's some new people too. So I don't want to confuse people on what's actually going on. And I do want to point out too that, um, uh, that you know, that suction valve test that I did is is not a very trusted test anymore, okay? And the reason why I say that is there was a, I'm pretty sure there was a Copeland Bulletin a while back on the Copeland CR compressors, which technically were air conditioning compressors, but a lot of people used them in medium temperature refrigeration for R22. And the CR compressors, when they first came out, they had a technical bulletin saying that you couldn't do the pump down test on them because they won't pump past five PSI from brand new. Um, and then as the compressor runs for about three or four years, it that, that pressure that it'll pump down to actually weakens and kind of goes a little bit higher and higher. So Using a pump down test, you shouldn't make that your only method of diagnosing a bad compressor. You always want to, you know, look at everything, look at the big picture and diagnose the system as a whole. So that system that I made a video on, um, I said it earlier in the chat, that video that I uploaded this morning was actually from a couple months ago. That was actually before the end of the year. I'd just been dragging butt on editing that video. And um, yeah, it just took me a while to get that all edited out and everything. But yeah, so that was an older video. I just finally got it figured out and edited and everything. So, um, that system, uh, more than likely the replacement video will be this Friday. So, and I do see some questions in here, guys, I'll get to those here in a few minutes. So, um, but yeah, that was an R22 system. It was time. You guys saw the coil. The coil was from 93. It was just time to replace that system. And we went ahead and upgraded it and, um, yeah, everything's up and running on that thing. So yeah, hopefully we'll get that video up Friday. I'll edit the other one down and, uh, get that ready for you guys. So, so that was one thing I wanted to point out. Um, saw it today as I was just kind of going through my mail, I had my, uh, a couple things that I hadn't gone through. I found my RCS magazine that, uh, came in for April. If you guys haven't, if you don't subscribe, you get the RCS journal, lots of great information in there. I probably shouldn't put that right there because my address is on there. So don't be a troll. Um, but yeah, the RCS journal, if you guys don't already subscribe to that magazine, you probably should. Um, you go to rscs.org. If you don't, I think you might be able to get like a free one year subscription. If you ever go to the trade shows and RSCS is there, they've always got something going on there saying where you can get a, a, a subscription for 
um, like a year or something like that for free. And if you're a member of RSCS, then you get the magazine automatically. So anyways, in that magazine, there's a great article about evacuating systems, proper vacuum procedures. It's actually a two part article. So the first part is just basically talking about a vacuum. And then the second part is going to be talking about setting the system up and hooking your hoses up and all that good stuff. So I thought that was a pretty cool article. So you guys should search that one out. And I believe you can do digital copies of that magazine too. If you guys don't like a print, I prefer I, I'm old school. So I like to hold it in my hand. So that's just me. I'm just an old, old school person. I still like the, you know, my troubleshooting books and different things to be physical copies versus like a, uh, um, uh, whatever you want to call a copy. So, um, okay. Uh, so I did see a question. I'm going to try to get to this real quick. Someone asked me, let me go back up into here. Let's see. Where's that? There we go. How often should the cooling pads on swamp coolers be changed? Manuel, um, it, it really depends on your climate. Okay. So I have a customer in Palm Springs where it's very dry and that swamp cooler, it's actually on that rack that you guys saw the video from today. It's on that piece of junk rack. It's a pre-cooler for the entire rack. Uh, that swamp cooler, the pads have to be changed on that every three months because it runs 24 seven. It's super dry out there and they have really hard water. So they get mineral deposits all over it. And the pads are so bad that you can't even change, like clean them. They just get calcified ridiculously bad. So it all depends on your water, water quality and, and, uh, you know, where you're located and stuff. So I have other places like here in the inland empire where I'm at in Southern California that we can go probably two years on some locations where it's not as hot. Uh, you know, and the, the swamp cooler only runs, you know, essentially when the exhaust fans are running or something. So yeah, it just depends on the area, but you know, once they become so calcified that you can't rinse the calcium off and they're no longer soft and you can't clean them, then it's time to change the pads. And on a swamp cooler too, you know, you're, you're better off with as cheap as they're made. Um, especially the ones that have like the straw pads, you're better off doing a full overhaul change, the water float, uh, temperature controller, if it has one, um, the belt oil, all the bearings, and change the pads, drain it, and possibly change the water pump at the same time. It's not a huge expense, and those parts fail so often that you might as well, when you're doing a tune-up on it, you should just really change those. That's that's the way I roll because um, it they last a lot longer that way. Now, my particular customer that I have to change the pads every three months, I don't necessarily change the water pump every three months, but it's more or less on the customers where I have to change the pads like every year or every two years then it's time to change the float and the water pump and all that good stuff. That, that's just my opinion to each their own. You know, I don't want you guys to push products on people that, that they don't need. So you guys have to make those judgment calls yourself. So, okay, go down here. All right. Um, so, uh, oh, that was another question that came up too. Uh, forgive me. I'm sorry if I forgot your name. You started in the beginning of the chat. Actually, I can just go back up here. It was Frank Bradley asked me about uh, my methods of changing motor sheaves and motor pulleys and that kind of stuff, okay? So I have a pulley puller uh, from a very long time ago. I, Gosh, I think it was my dad's when I started working with him and it's lasted me forever. I still use it to this day. So I can't tell you the name of it because it's not on there anymore, but it's just a standard puller, okay? Just your standard three arm puller you can adjust them to the different lengths this thing will get pulleys and bearings and all that good stuff off um there's a company uh actually who is it it's called the the tool is called the black max puller it's made by cps uh you can get it at your local supply houses uh i've seen it i haven't used it i don't know if it'll last as long as this one because this one's last 15 plus years but uh yeah cps makes one it looks pretty decent i think they've got some newer ones that have new technology and they got springs and different things in them. I have also seen them at my local hardware stores, not like a cheap, cheap Harbor Freight one, but I've seen some other ones at local hardware stores that uh, also have spring mechanisms inside of them and different things too. So that will uh, will definitely do your job when you want to uh, pull anything off, whether it be a bearing. Um, another thing too, if you're changing like a pillow block bearing, this is more of a visual, but I can kind of describe it to you. A little cheat for a pillow block bearing is depending on the bearing size, like if uh, what you want to do is go get a piece of uh, black iron or galvanized pipe that's bigger than the shaft, just bigger than the shaft so it can slide over the shaft and you can put it on the bearing, you know, and then just tap the, the, the black iron or the galvanized pipe and it'll push the bearing further onto the shaft. Of course, before you do that, you want to sand the shaft and clean it up on the other side of the bearing. 
once you get that bearing pushed further on the shaft, then you can sand underneath it and in front of it, and then you'll be able to slide the bearing right off. So that's another method for changing like pillow block bearings. It's, it's not very common that we get to change pillow block bearings anymore, at least with uh, working in restaurants, because they just change things now. Nobody wants to put $1,200 into an exhaust fan when they can go buy a cheap, you know, uh, captive air one, uh, th- which, I mean, they last for a while, you know, so they get them by. So um, hello to everybody that's coming in. I see you guys all saying hi. So uh, Manuel, you said, is there any way to help quiet the vibration on a barred wall unit that is on a trail office? You know, but it, the vibration is coming from something. So you've got a blower assembly that's out of balance. You've got a condenser fan motor that's out of balance, or you've got something that's wrong in your compressor more than likely that's causing that unit to vibrate. It's not the unit itself. You need to investigate why it's vibrating and that will solve your problem. So exactly. Yeah. Find what's vibrating and then change it. So yeah, auto parts sell the, sell those pulley pullers too. Um, I don't know. It, it might get the job done. I'm not a fan of spending a bunch, but uh, Chris H., you want to know my thoughts on RX11 flush? So that's actually on my topic right now. So, and I'm going to go ahead and cover that. That's something else that I was going to cover. So um, I had some other questions on my video that I posted on Friday, which was a grounded compressor. Okay. Um, there was a lot of things wrong with that AC. You guys, if you watched the video, you saw that it had a big airflow problem. Okay. On top of that, the low pressure controls between the first and the second stage were swapped. So if there was a low pressure problem on the second stage, which is the compressor that I replaced, the compressor wouldn't have shut off because it was monitoring the first stage. Right. Um, then on top of that, you guys see how close that condenser was to the wall. It was about 10 inches away from a wall and that's a 12 ton unit. Um, what else was wrong with it? Oh, and it had a massive airflow problem. Someone had brought up because I pointed out, I think in the video that we had like 1.38 or 1.28 static pressure, uh, total external static across the, the package unit. And someone, uh, Dimitri, thank you so very much, man. I really appreciate it. So someone had pointed out that, you know, well, package units are meant to run one inch of static. Yes, a lot of package units are, and some of them are meant to run more. Okay. But they're not meant to run one inch of static on the supply side. All right. <laughs> that unit had one over one inch of static just on the supply side. And the return side of that unit actually wasn't ducted. The return side was pulling attic air. So that's why you had no pressure drop basically across the return. The only pressure drop was going through the, uh, the, the curb adapter basically. Then once it dropped out of the curb adapter, it just went straight into the attic and then they just have open grills inside the ceiling in the restaurant. So that unit had a lot of problems. Um, now let's get back to the, uh, the, the compressor replacement. So when I changed the compressor on that, I, um, I didn't have room in the system. I made a judgment call that I wasn't going to put in a suction filter dryer. Okay. And the reason why I did that was because if you install a suction filter dryer, majority of the time you're supposed to go back and replace it. If you come back and you find out that you have no pressure drop, it's okay. You can leave it in. But most of the time, it's going to plug up, right? So I had to make a judgment call because I could get that thing in there, but I'd probably have to pull the top off the unit to replace it. So I decided to run without a suction filter dryer on that system. I did put a high acid, a Sporlin 16.3 HH, so a 16 cubic inch, 3 8 inch uh, line size with the HH core. So that was the high acid core. I did put that in there. Now, I did not use any flush in the system, and I'm going to tell you guys why. Um, Ever since I heard, well, I was kind of already getting a little skeptical about using these flushes and different things, okay? Because I never really saw any big results by using a flush, even like an acid neutralizer. I never got a big, big result out of it. And I was always kind of curious as to what I was adding to the system. And the flush, it's really easy to, to put flush in there and... If you don't do it right, you know, it could get stuck in the system. So I was, I was very skeptical about using the flush. And then when it came to the acid neutralizers, like the acid scavenger or whatever, you know, one of those new Calgon products, I just, I don't know. I felt uncomfortable putting them in the system because, you know, I remember coming up in the trade, I was taught you were never supposed to put anything in the system. But then all of a sudden we, we really started listening to these supply houses and the supply houses were telling us, oh yeah, use this stuff. It's safe. It's manufacturer recommended. And so we just started using everything. Now I got to be fair 
and say that I never saw a real problem from using flush and I never saw a real problem from using an acid neutralizer, but I just didn't feel comfortable using them. Um, so I was getting kind of leery about using them and I was really starting to like lean off of it. And then when I heard the first time I heard John Pastorello from refrigeration technologies on, I think it was Brian Orr's podcast or I think I'm pretty sure that was the first time I heard him. And he was really talking about what those chemicals are and what, and, and he was just breaking it down. It just really set me over the edge. And I just kind of decided to stop using those unless I had to Now there, I mean, I'm not going to lie and say I haven't used them since that podcast, but I've just really been coming back and taking it easy on using them. And this particular system, I really thought it wasn't that contaminated. The, comp the oil was, con was contained in the compressor. I think there might have been like five ounces or four ounces of oil that was unaccounted for, right? I think when I, when I poured the oil out of that compressor. So it was just a couple ounces. So I really didn't think that, that the system was contaminated enough to put a flush or an acid neutralizer in there, okay? So I'm not knocking anybody for using flushes or acid neutralizers. I'm not going to knock you for using dye. I'm not going to knock you for using uh, a leak sealant, okay? It's just not what I want to do. I don't want to be putting that stuff in the system if I don't have to, okay? Because I just don't know what's going to happen later, especially with these new systems. They're super high efficient. I just, I don't want to cause problems. So my outlook on it is I'm going to try not to use any neutralizers or flushes or anything in my system. So, you know, to each their own, you know, I'm not judging anybody for doing it. So, um, yeah, Frank, I, I mean, you know, uh, Frank asked, wouldn't your vacuum remove whatever remnants of the RX 11 flush? You would think so, but what, what is that liquid? What kind of, um, what kind of residue is it leaving in the system? That's what I want to know. Yes. Uh, you know, the liquid refrigerant, right? It would probably boil off. Sure. But what residues is it leaving in there? That's what I'm afraid of. So, you know, I, I, I would really like to see some science behind it. Uh, I, I've definitely heard, uh, Mr. John Pastorello from refrigeration technologies talk about it. Um, but you know, I'd like to see some science. I, you know, of course, new cow is going to tell you that, oh yeah, it's safe and all this different stuff. But I don't think it was them, but there was another company out there. One of the big manufacturers that was pitching. And I think I talked about this last time they were pitching, um, something that you put in the system so you don't have to vacuum it down. It was like this can of dry stuff. It was for moist systems. You, you like sprayed it in there and it's supposed to, and it's just like, I'm so sick of these guys telling us that these things are safe. Cause that's baloney. You can't, you know, whatever that stuff was called, it was like easy dry or some weird stuff in a can. And I don't think it was new Calgon. I think it was another company and they were pushing something. And I just, I don't trust those guys anymore. So, you know, um, I feel a lot more comfortable if I get a compressor manufacturer like Copeland saying something is safe, then I feel a little more comfortable about using it. But, um, you know, until, until they're willing to stand behind it, I'm kind of a little leery about using the, the, the flushes and the neutralizers and stuff. So, uh, Manuel Nahar asked if there's any classes that are being offered this year, I recommend to take, um, you know, off the top of my head right now, I don't know. It depends on your area. Look up your local RSES chapter, RSES.org find out where they have local meetings. Those are usually free classes unless it's like a seminar and those might cost some money. But, um, you know, uh, here in Southern California, we have the energy, energy education center in Irwindale. And then the, there's a, um, a sister to that at, uh, SoCal gas and Downey, and they offer, um, all kinds of subsidized training classes that are great. Um, it's through I hacky, I H A C I. Um, you know, so that that's kind of all off the top of my head. Um, you can email me. I can try to send some more stuff or maybe I can try to get them all written down and do, you know, bring them up on my next live stream or something. So, all right. Um, let me see. What do you think compressor manufacturers are not giving? Oh, why do I think compressor manufacturers are not giving insight about chemicals? Um, I mean, at least what I've heard from my Copeland reps is, is they don't mind approving a chemical for use in their compressors. But the way that it was told to me, and maybe this is complete baloney, but what Copeland has told me, their rep, was that they put a lot of money into um, researching and investigating chemicals. So if the manufacturer is willing to front the cost for that research, then I think Copeland is okay. They'll, they'll, they'll follow through. And if it comes back positive, then they'll... I could be talking complete crap right now, but I, I thought that's what I heard. I thought basically the amount of money that Copeland puts into it, they're not going to do it for free. And uh, so basically, I think that was the gist of what I heard. So if the manufacturer was willing to front the cost and Copeland thought it was a good product, then I bet you that they would approve it or at least give it a look and find out if it's safe for their systems. So, 
Um, is there any training simulators for AC, a, HVAC? I, I don't know, Abraham. Not that I, I know there is. There's some apps and different things you can do. Um, yeah, there, there's go to you. You know, Brian Orr is a really great resource for a lot of the training stuff too. Uh, HVACRschool.com. Uh, he has a lot of great training resources on there too for you guys that want to get online training. If you don't already subscribe to his podcast and check his tech tips out and stuff like that. Um, okay, so you said you use the copper glue for drain lines because you're in New York City and they have to be copper and some places require a fire watch and burn permits. I wouldn't trust that stuff with pressure. Yeah, nah, that'd be a little leery. I had one of the people, and, and this is going to actually segue into something else that I want to copy or talk about is, and um, guys, if I'm missing your guys' questions, you're not going to make us upset. Put them back in the chat again, okay? Because I'm going to talk for a minute. I might miss some more. So just keep putting them in the chat and we'll get to them, okay? Um, so I want to bring up to you guys. So as as my, my, my YouTube videos and my live stream gets bigger, right? We have quite a few followers now. Um, and we have, uh, you know, a little bit of a presence, small little presence. And, and I, I kind of make videos in my little niche, which is restaurant refrigeration. I'm starting to get a lot of manufacturers reaching out to me. And a lot of the people, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't give the time a day. Okay. Um, if I, if I will converse with the manufacturer, I mean, I'm polite, I'm not rude, but people that are selling, like wanting to send me these weird products. Like I had a guy that wanted to send me like laundry additives and it was weird. It was just, just weird stuff like deodorizers. And we just, I'm not, I'm, that's not my thing. I'm not pitching products. Okay. Um, I'm not saying that I'll never work with someone. Okay. Because, uh, here starting in May, yeah, there's going to be a sponsor on the, the, the videos and the podcast. Okay. But it's someone that I believe in. I'm not saying that I trust every single thing that they do, but they're a good company and I, I honestly trust them. Okay. I'm, I'm only willing to work with people that, that aren't selling snake oils and weird things that I, I wouldn't use myself. I'm not going to try to push things on you guys. Okay. So if you do hear me talking about something, you know, it's, it's, I'm not endorsing it completely, but I, I'm just not going to be pushing weird stuff on you guys. So just know that. Okay. Um, you know, and I don't want to be, I get some companies like, for instance, there's a tool manufacturer um, that I'm technically still working with, but there's no money involved. They just sent me some tools to check out and stuff like that. But, you know, once I made a video and like showcased their tool, then they, they sent me an email asking me to change the title of my video and, and, and put links to where you can buy their tool. And yeah, just, that's not what I want to do. You know, like that's, that's not how I want my channel to go. So I'm going to do this my way. And, uh, I'm going to try to not bombard you with a bunch of BS and weird crap and stuff like that. So, so hopefully you guys can um, trust when you see something that I say is an interesting product, okay? Like, for instance, you know, that field piece S-Man 480. Uh, I really dig that product. Now, it's not the, it's, a, it's the new manifold that was just released. I've been beta testing it with a bunch of other really cool guys um, all over the United States, and we've all been testing it and beating it up and dropping it and kicking it and hosing it down and all kinds of stuff to try to test the limits of it. I'm not saying that that thing's the best tool in the world, but it's, it's a pretty good quality tool. I mean, I, I put it through my abuse and it works great. Uh, I'm not getting compensated for them by that or anything like that, you know, but I, I just want you guys to know that I'm not going to try to push weird products on you guys. So, all right, I'll get off that rant. I don't know why I went into that for some reason, but all right. Um, hey, I want to point out, I'm going to put it in the chat right now. I did see, and I don't know if he wants me to do this or not, but I'm going to go ahead and put this in here. Uh, control V. I noticed that uh, Zach Ciotta is going to start a new YouTube channel. Um, I just put the link in there. You guys uh, copy that link down um, and go subscribe to that. Uh, be cool and don't ditch my my stream right now to go. But go subscribe to his new channel. It's not going to be an HVAC related thing. I think it's just going to be more just general talk about whatever. So I thought that was worth putting in there. So check that channel out for him. I'm sure he would appreciate some subs to that. Um, okay. Now I'm going to try to get some of your guys' questions again, okay? So if uh, prime time, man, you know, dude, I'm old school too, but you're going to have to make the jump, dude, because digital is, I'd say in 90% of the time, digital is better. There's a small percentage that it's not, but there's a very large percentage of where it's better. Um, the biggest downside to digital gauges is the, uh, what do you want to call it? The, what's it called? How fast they react. 
I, it's right on the tip of my tongue. I can't think of it right now. But so basically, if you're doing a pump down test on a compressor with a compound gauge, you can watch the needle drop as the system pressure is dropping with a digital gauge. It takes a second. It's like, you know, a half a second behind. So sometimes you don't get to see it drop five, four, three, two, one. You see five, one. You know, you don't see that that real quick movement. But other than that, man, digital, you can see a lot more with digital, in my opinion. Okay. So um I, I do think that people need to know how to use compound gauges, okay, and how to use a, a standard temperature pressure chart. But once a technician's learned that, um, I think that digital is the way to go. So personal preference, no, you know, no, not judging anybody. But Joe65, thanks so much, man. I really appreciate it. Okay. Uh, no, Gary Black Jr., man. Use the field piece S-mans. Uh, they, they do fine. And I mean, I'm not going to – they're not rated like – waterproof but they can they, they'll be fine in the rain so all right you can get them wet all right i mean you want to do your best to keep them out of the rain but you know you can you can get them occasionally wet they can get drizzled on they can get they, they can handle some water so um and so can a lot of the other ones too but again i'm not saying go drench them in water but i will tell you guys that in the beta tests we were told to hose those things down and there's a lot of guys out there that were just hosing the damn things down and they work just fine so I'm not saying to go dip them in water, but they work good. Um, okay, Reefer Tech Mark, you said your industry is just now starting to go to three-phase scrolls. Could you go into properly checking a scroll for, um, oh, okay, grounded, etc. Yeah, scroll compressors, that is a whole thing. I'm going to, I'll try to put that on a, an, a, a thing to make a video on those, Reefer Tech Mark, okay? And I'll try to make an actual dedicated video on checking out scroll compressors and how scroll compressors work. Um you know, uh, it was actually brought up, um, Zach had asked in the last podcast in the last, uh, live stream, Zach from HVAC shop talk, he had asked if I was going to have guests on here. And I think that'd be a really cool one. If maybe we can have, cause I want to, if, if I end up having guests on this live stream, I want it to be guests that I don't want it to be the same as everybody else's live streams. Right. I don't want to have the same guests as everybody else does, or even at least if I do have a guest that someone else already has, I want to talk about things that are in my little niche you know, working with uh, light commercial refrigeration and, um, you know, three phase stuff and different stuff. So maybe we could work something out with like the, I have a local Copeland rep here or something like that. Maybe I could work something out with him. So, um, but yeah, I'll definitely try to make a video at a minimum on three phase compressors, scroll compressors, how they work and different stuff like that. So maybe we can get one cut apart and, you know, all that fun stuff. I'll reach out to um, Copeland on that. Okay. So let's see. Um, no, uh, Comp GB said, have I ran into any more heat craft issues with the carbon flakes? No, that, that video where I showed you guys the carbon flakes, I haven't seen that one happen again yet. Cause I did do a couple more coils after that. And, uh, I opened them up and no, they weren't like that. That one was a hideous one. So that must've been a Friday. So, and they just took their time. Um, yeah, I, there, Sean Mack. Yeah. Copeland. I I've read something about that. A fake short to ground continuity readings on Copeland scrolls. Um, you also got to be careful too, because, uh, I haven't cut that compressor open from the beer walk-in from about three weeks ago. I still have it sitting at my shop, but that one is a three phase compressor. That was the one that had the external overload on it. And I want to cut it open to figure out if there's an internal overload too. But, uh, I did find out that that compressor has what they call it's wound with a Scott T winding, which is different because even though it's three phase, all three legs will not equal each other. So you have one leg that's got a greater, um, resistance value versus the other two legs so you do have to be careful and in, in, um for some reason i thought i read a bulletin on a scroll compressor having that before too or something but i'd have to do some more research so you got to be cautious about ohming out compressors um copeland uh does have a tech bulletin about how inaccurate a uh, a mega ohm meter is on a scroll compressor they definitely have a a thing on that and copeland's basic stance on mega ohm meters is that they should use, be used for preventative maintenance measures and not necessarily like a walk up and say this compressor is bad they want you to to trend the data to confirm that a compressor is going bad and if you know how a mega ohm meter go works too if the if the system has a lot of moisture in it it can read a high resistance too so um you, you just have to understand how to use your tools before you just jump up so i'm saying if you go buy that subco mega ohm meter that you can buy at the supply houses you know you can't necessarily just trust that thing because it says bad because it can read um, danger or whatever when the system has a lot of moisture in it too. 
So you got to be cautious about dying, you know, condemning a compressor just because that thing's that same reason where I was talking about at the beginning of the stream about the suction service valve pump down test. You can't just diagnose just on that. You have to look at the big picture and look at everything. Okay. Evaluate the amp draw. Um, another point I'll recover it again real quick. Cause I know there's more people in this stream right now. We've got 130 people in here right now. Um, in the beginning, I was covering the video that I uploaded today about the suction service valve test. And I wanted to point out that I did say, and even on the title of the video, I wrote bad suction service valve, right? Uh, weak suction valve or something. Um, it did have a weak suction service valve, but I wanted to point out that the gas leaking by that I was talking about why the pressure was rising on the suction side was actually because the, the discharge valve was weak. And it's more or less semantics. You know, I, I want to make sure that I'm accurate for you guys, but it, someone had said it to me and it's like, it's really not that big of a deal. It had bad valves, but you know, I, I do want to point out that it actually had a weak suction valve, but then it also had a bad discharge valve. And technically it's the little reed inside of there that was weak and the gas for was leaking from the high side into the low side. So I just want to make sure, and you guys understand something too. I'm human. Okay. Um, I, I don't want these videos to be like rehearsed and, and that kind of stuff. Okay. So you guys are seeing what's happening and I don't necessarily always say the right things, but, um, if you guys are paying attention to the video and looking at everything, sometimes you'll know what I mean. You know, I may misspeak about something and I try to correct it, try to catch it in editing, but sometimes I don't. So, okay. Have I ever seen a single phase condenser fan motor running in reverse with a good run cap? Um, I know I've seen a single phase compressor running in reverse for sure. Um, I don't know if I've ever seen one with a bad run cap or with a good run cap though. That's an interesting one. Yeah. Yeah. Beer can cold gets you pretty close with experience. I Andrew, I mean, you know, that, that, that beer can cold thing is one of those things that's you're said to be a hack if you use beer can cold. Right. But that is a vital sign. It, it, there is truth in that. I don't want you to go diagnose the system and say, because it's beer can cold, the suction line's good. You know, you're good to go. But I'm also saying that, you know, if, if you know how a system works, you can use that as a troubleshooting method. You know, you can, some of your things that you do, you know, you can basically say, Hey, this thing is, um, you know, everything's going good, but then, uh, but, um, you know, everything's working. Okay. Uh, it has a cold suction line. It's got a, a hot discharge line. It's got a, a warm liquid line. You know, you're using vital signs. You're looking at the big picture. Okay. So sometimes you may do that instead of putting service gauges on a system. Now, I'm not saying that's the proper way. You should always charge via superheater, subcooling, that kind of stuff. But if you're just doing a quick check and you're walking over doing a PM and the PM doesn't call for putting your gauges on every unit, then, you know, grabbing a suction line and grabbing a discharge line and knowing how warm and hot and cold and different things those things should be. Once you get to know a system, you know, that's not a horrible thing to do. Now, I'm not saying beer can cold is the way, right way to diagnose, but those are vital signs. So there is some truth in beer can cold. Okay. Don't blow the internet up with what I just said, but, um, <laughs> nasty. Yeah. Guys that are just coming in, it's, I got sunburnt this weekend and then I've got the white head because just before the stream, I shaved my head. So, cause I had, my hair was getting really long. So yeah, I got sunburn on my forehead. I, it was my wife's birthday yesterday and we went down to uh, Laguna beach and had breakfast with my sister and my parents and stuff. So, and I was out in the sun for about an hour and I got fried. So this is one of the downsides. I wear um, long sleeve. I'm wearing a short sleeve right now, but I wear long sleeve work shirts all through the summer. So every time I go outside, my arms get sunburnt now too, when I'm in a short sleeve. So it's very interesting. I used to have these horrible farmer's tans that were permanent. You know, my, 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 it's still got a little bit of a farmer's tan there, but like I would turn, you know, white right here. And I was worried about skin cancer and all that stuff. So I, I wear hats and weird things now, but of course, when I'm on my personal time, I don't have my stupid hat with my head scarf and all that fancy stuff. So, all right. Um, okay. I'm going to go to some more questions that I had from emails. Okay. Um, okay. Trade schools and education. So someone said, Hey, do you recommend going to a trade school? Do you recommend learning without going to a trade school? Do you recommend Nate? You know, I've been getting those questions a lot. I've said this before. Any education is better than no education. Do I think that a trade school is going to teach you everything you need to know to start tomorrow? No. Someone who goes through trade school is not going to know everything. They still need to go through a proper apprenticeship. Okay. I have a guy that's working with me and the plan is three to six months. He's going to be riding with me for at least three to six months and maybe longer. It just depends. Okay. Um, and that's just how it is. So he finished trade school. He's a really smart guy 
And he, you know, he's going to be riding with me for three to six months, depending on how things go. And that's just how it is. And, and I'll bill for what I can with his time, but I can't bill for all of his time. That's just how it is. And that's just something I have to accept as a business owner. So I'm not angry that he doesn't know everything out of trade school. So trade school is not necessarily going to teach you everything, but trade schools are valuable. Okay. They're not horrible. They're good. But I will say you need to interview your trade schools. Okay. Don't just assume because they have a cool website that it's the best school in the world. Talk to people. Even if you're an HVAC or a person that's not even in the industry yet and you want to get into the trade, call the local supply houses and ask them, hey, where do you hear good things about trade schools? Which schools do you hear the best about? Call refrigeration and air conditioning companies in your area, even if you're not going to work for them. Just ask them, hey, I'm interested in getting in the field. What trade schools do you recommend? If someone calls me asking that, I'm going to answer that. Okay. So you still need to interview the schools that you're going to go to, whether you go to a community college or a private trade school. I'd be very, very cautious. I always say this, be very cautious about paying tons of money up front for a trade school because you don't know how it's going to work out. Um, I, I like the community college programs, but there's some that are bad too. But the cool thing about community college programs is you can usually do night classes and you can pay a little bit at a time and you can work while you're going there. So if you can work something like that out with a trade school, I think that'd be better too. Okay. So, um, same thing goes for like Nate training and any kind of certifications is Nate training going to make me more money. No, doesn't make me more money. Okay. I'm Nate certified in a bunch of different things. It doesn't make me any more money, but it keeps me on top of my education to maintain my Nate certification. Yes. There's a little bit of a racket involved with Nate because you have to pay every two years, a couple hundred bucks. Okay. I can deal with that, but it maintains my, my education. It makes me continue my education to maintain my Nate cert. I have to take classes. I have to go to my RSCS classes. I have to log my hours that I teach, you know, that I, that I tr take classes and different things like that. So any education is better than no education. All right. Um, let me see what else I'm missing in here. I got some more stuff I want to cover, but um, I don't know. Oh, okay. I see what's going on. Okay. Um, let's see. That California lifestyle, huh, Gary? <laughs> Why have manufacturers like Charleston stopped adding ports to units? Rafael Gomez. Okay. So um, it's all about money, bud. Money, 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 okay? And uh, they have the excuse with the R290 systems that they're not adding ports to, but that's baloney, okay? It's all about money. If they can save 10 cents a unit and they manufacture 10,000 units a year, they've saved a bunch of money, okay? Or 10 million units a year. They've saved a bunch of money. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's all about money. Now, there's also the, the, the thought that, you know, because it's such a small system and there's truth to this because it's such a small system, they want you to think before you put your gauges on it. There's truth in that. Okay. But, um, you know, it's, it's really comes down to money. That's why all these manufacturers don't put service ports on the unit because they can charge it with a machine. They can laser weld the line shut or sonic weld it, whatever they use and then move on. And it saves them that much money on manufacturing. So that's exactly why manufacturers don't add ports to units. Um, Okay, let's see what else I got going on here. What else? Guys, in the chat, um, I saw that there was a message deleted. Guys, let's not let's not bash each other, okay? Let's try to keep this civil. I know, you know, some people don't have good opinions of other people on different things. Well, let's try to keep it civil in here, okay? I definitely don't want my streams to be a drama. I want to try to help everybody as much as possible. So let's try to keep it to a minimum. You know, just try to be cool, guys. Um Okay. Just Russ. My video last week about people not doing their jobs. Can I expand? Yeah. I went on a rant last week in the video where I was talking about um, a restaurant that had poor ductwork on the HVAC system. I had, uh, uh, I should say the air conditioning system. And then it also had poor ductwork on the exhaust fan system. And this restaurant was built within the time frame that it had to pass all Title 24 codes and it had to be inspected by the city. And I basically raised the question, whose fault was it? Was it the engineer that designed the system? Was it the technician or the serve mechanical contractor that installed the system? Was it the code inspector that inspected the system? Or was it the third party verification company's problem that verified that all the system was correct? This is a very common thing in our industry. Okay. There was, there was four, let's just say people, right? in essence, that 
were responsible for that restaurant being the way that it was. It went through four methods of, of verification to make sure things were done right. And those four people all failed their jobs because that restaurant is operating with horrible ductwork with, uh, you know, and it's very energy efficient. They lost a compressor with, you know, they've got all kinds of problems. They've got smoke problems in their kitchen. And then on top of that, I got to also point out too that particular restaurant last year, they called me in the middle of the summer when the, when they had a massive thunderstorm and they, they said, uh, exhaust fan stopped working, a fire sprinkler went off and someone pulled the Ansel system. So I'm thinking they had a building fire. So I run over there get to the restaurant. The fire marshal was there. They had the place closed down. There's water everywhere. And I'm talking to the fire marshal and he's telling me this is that same building that has all those ductwork problems. He was telling me that what happened was the exhaust fan had a, had a problem. There was definitely something wrong with the exhaust fan. It was running slow. Okay. That was a whole nother issue, but someone installed all the wrong fire sprinklers in the kitchen. The fire sprinklers, um, temperature was too low. And the fire marshal said, these are all the wrong sprinklers. So on top of all that, Right. So then that one fire sprinkler went off and one of the cooks got scared and he pulled the Ansel system and set off the Ansel system. So on top of all the ductwork problems, they also installed all the wrong fire sprinklers at that location, too. So what a cluster F that restaurant was. And it went through all the proper methods. It was permitted. It was, you know, everybody did what they were supposed to do as far as pulling permits and getting approvals. But then nobody followed through that inspected that building and nobody followed through that installed the equipment. I mean, it was just a mess. And that's a very common thing here in California, in the United States, and even in Canada and other countries. Everybody has reached out to me on that video when I went off on that rant and said, it's not just there, it's everywhere. Like, that's just horrible that we can't do our jobs. You know, you know that a lot of the, 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 the third party verification here in Southern California. So if we want to get a permit on something, we have to go through HERS Raiders. HERS Raiders are basically a third party verification company that comes in and makes sure that we did our job right, right? It's very interesting because the point that the, the, the fact that we have to have a third party verification company basically tells us that we're not doing our jobs right. We can't be trusted. And that's horrible that we as contractors and technicians can't be trusted. It's just but it's not just us. It's all trades. It's just a horrible thing. I don't know the answer. I have a lot of opinions about politics and all kinds of things, but I do not have the answers. I mean, I'm just yeah, it's crazy. So, um, Okay, let me see what else I missed here. Have I thought about starting my own podcast? Dimitri. Hey guys, I want to point this out. So yes, I'll answer that right now, Dimitri. Anybody remember McDonald's in the late 80s, early 90s, having these cups? This is from McDonald's from like 1992, 1989, somewhere in there. These little McDonald's cups with Snoopy and whatever, right? This has nothing to do with HVAC. So I was cleaning out my wife's grandmother's house and apparently they collected those cups. So I've got like a set of like 20 of those cups. And I remember those from when I was a kid and I love those things. They're so corny looking, but they, you know, the funny thing is I've had these things, they're glass. I've had them for two years now and I wash them in the dishwasher every day and the, the, the paint or anything's not wearing off the cups. It just shows you it's probably cancer causing and all these bad things, but these things are lasting forever. So, all right, let me get back to, uh, let me get back to these. So, um, the question, have I ever thought about starting my own podcast? Dimitri? Yeah, dude. It's just one of these things. I, I, I am going to start a podcast. I've already got the domain. I'm paying for it. I've got podcast hosting set up. It's just a matter of me recording it. The podcast is going to be called the absence of heat podcast. Um, yeah, I've got everything set up. I just haven't done it yet. So yes, I am going to do it. It's just a matter of me finding time. You guys understand something. Um, you know, I work a full-time job. I, I run an HVAC company with my dad. We have employees where, you know, we have normal, normal business. I have a family. I have two daughters and a wife. Um, and, you know, and then I do these videos and these live streams. And I'm just trying to find, trying to juggle the time to make sure that I can still spend time with my family and different things. But yes, there is a podcast coming. So that's why, um, let me, that's why I bought these fancy mics and this fancy mixing board, you know, See if I can pop this thing up here real quick. Uh, there we go. Let me close that and transfer over. That's why I have this funky mixing board, this road fancy mixing board and this mic that I'm using and different things. And I have another mic just like this so I can have guests and different things for the podcast. You know, I am going to do a podcast eventually. It's just a matter of me finding the time to do so. And I will do it. So it's just uh, taking me some time to get to it. So we'll go and transition back there. There we go. So yes, it will come for sure. Just a matter of me getting 
off my lazy butt and doing it. So I could DJ in my off time. There you go. Um, okay. So best product to do an acid test or burnout test. Um, Sporlin has a kit. It's a little acid test kit. You pour a little bit of the oil in a vial, shake it up and the oil will change color when it's mixed with that, you know, whatever product, um, refrigeration technologies has got an acid test kit. Um, and then also there's the, the quick acid test that you have that little, um, that paper and you put it on the Schrader and you poke it on there. I think it's made by quick or something like that. So the quick one, that would be the quickest little easiest acid test to do, but the most high quality acid test you can do is probably follow that Sporlin, uh, chemical or the, um, refrigeration technologies one one of those two would probably be the best one to do an acid test that i would trust the most so um yeah that, that'd be an interesting idea andrew andrew hicks is saying he wants to be chef ramsey and go around to companies with bad reps and scream and throw stuff until they figure it out yeah that, that'd be an interesting idea get companies working you know make a reality show out of it there you go andrew you should, you should figure that out, dude. Make a reality show. You can make millions. You'll, you'll be a millionaire. Just just give me a million when you start making a bunch of money, okay? Um, A-Team Adam, any tips to a new HVAC YouTube dude? Okay, so uh, that's that's a great question, Adam. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you too. You guys, anybody that has questions about making YouTube videos or a podcast, right? Reach out to someone that's doing it. If you guys have questions about what gear I'm using, you don't need to go buy the fanciest stuff, Okay. If you're going to start making YouTube videos, it, if you have the content, people will follow. Okay. There's some podcasters out there. I'm not going to name any names, but there's some podcasters that have horrible, horrible audio quality, but yet they get listeners. People listen to their podcast. Uh, personally, I can't listen to some of those because the audio quality is so horrible, even though they have, you know, but, but other people still listen to it. Okay. So me personally, I can't, but other people do. So start with the content. If you have good content and the best advice I can give you. What helped me start these YouTube videos and, 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 you know, sharing them with people and growing to the subs where I'm at. And I'm, I'm still a super tiny channel. We just passed 22,000 subs, just super tiny, right? Nothing big, like these big giant YouTubers that are making millions of dollars or anything like that. Okay. But, um, just make good content and be honest about your content and don't say things that aren't true. So there's, there's, I'm not joking with you. I should show you guys my hard drive. I have a hard drive of videos that I won't make because I rewatched them and realized, oh yeah, that's wrong. You know, I, I can't do that. I didn't say that right. You know? And so, you know, there's so much content that I throw away because I was, you know, talking and it's like, I said that totally wrong, you know? So I won't release it. So just be honest. Um, don't spend a ton of money on, on, on audio gear and stuff like that. Start out small and work your way up. Just buy a simple road Mike, that's what I started with was a, or not a road mic, a, a Yeti, blue Yeti mic. And it's a USB mic. You don't have to X, XLR, none of that stuff. You know, some people even make videos off their phones. There's all kinds of programs out there where you can make videos off your phones and different things. If you guys have questions about how I do the videos and different things, I can give you little tips and, and just email me, um, HVACR videos at gmail.com and I'll send you guys the tips. But there's other podcasters out there, too, that are totally cool. So reach out to the other guys, too. You know, when I was starting this, um, Andrew Greaves answered a lot of questions for me. I was a little curious how he did this and how he did that. Um, and Andrew Greaves was very open and shared like, oh, yeah, I do this and I do that. And, you know, gave me some confidence, basically, to, you know, I knew I knew I could make the videos because I, I knew what I was doing. But it was just a matter of how do I produce this? How do I do that? And, you know, I reached out to him. He helped me. And then I've, you know, shared my knowledge with a bunch of people, too. So, Okay. Let's see. What am I missing? Yeah. Don't let negative comments bother you either. Just like Justin said. So, all right. Yep. Be consistent on video uploads. Just like Dizzy Dallas says, definitely consistency. I upload Mondays and Fridays. And then the beginning, it was Monday, Wednesday, and Friday to, to build my presence. I was, I was draining myself Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, a video, every three videos a week. And it was killing me, but I did it. And that's what got me started. And I'm going to say that, dare I say the dangerous words, Facebook was very, very helpful for me. I share my stuff on Facebook. I don't really share it too much anymore. Every once in a while I share it in groups, but I used to spam every group. Be careful about spamming groups too, um, because a lot of people don't appreciate that, but I did it in the beginning. It was a horrible thing. Uh, I regret doing it because I used to just basically put it in every single, and now I have people asking me, will you please post your stuff in my group? And I, I try to, but most of the time I just post on my own pages now. 
um, once I got a following on my Facebook page and my Facebook profile and different things. So, but yeah, Facebook definitely helped me too. just be cautious because there is a lot of trolls out there. So if you've got thin skin, be ready. Um, yes, 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 yes. Rayman 1230. Make sure you don't film anything that will hold you liable. That's something you guys notice. I'm very scared about in my videos. I don't film my customers locations just to protect my customers. I'm not doing anything wrong, but I don't film where I'm at. I don't film people's faces. I don't film things that are just massive problems. I, there's certain things. And, and so if I can give anybody any advice, please don't make a DIY video. I'm not a fan of DIY videos personally. Okay. Some people do that. That's your thing, but DIY videos are what hurt people. Okay. So if you notice my videos, I get comments all the time. How come you don't show the beginning to end? I purposely don't show beginning to end. I show you guys a problem. I show you some interesting stuff in the middle and I show you the end. That's it. I do not show you from start to finish. I'm not going to show you how to turn on my torches, how to light them, how to do this. This is what I set my pressures at because that makes me liable and I'm not going to do that. So be cautious about the things you say too and make sure if you do say something, you're correct or put a disclaimer in there and I would lean away from talking about controversial topics. So be cautious about that. Is that a redfish on my desk? That was a very, very quick I there, Josh. Let's go back to that and see if I can pull that back up. Turn this off and pull that back. Yes, that is a redfish on my desk. I just ordered it right here. I just ordered it from True Tech Tools. I'm very interested in it. And let me transition this back. I'm very interested in it. This was not sent to me for free. I paid my own money for this. Um, very interesting. I have not even had the chance to use it. I just opened it, um, put it in my van and I will be, uh, definitely putting it to use and checking it out. Um, I am a fan of my field piece SC 660 because of the phase rotation test. So I'm not going to be retiring my field piece SC 660, but the measure quick definitely looks very interesting. So, all right. Um, Exactly. Just like Justin said, that's the whole point of my videos because my videos are made for technicians. They're not made for homeowners or restaurant owners to try to fix their own stuff. That's not what my videos are ever going to be about. I, you know, I could easily gain more subscribers. It's not about the subscribers. Um, I, you know, I'm not going to lie to you and say I don't make money from YouTube. I make a couple bucks from YouTube, but it's not about the money. I started making these videos for my own employees and it blew up from there. But, but to this day, my videos and, and tomorrow and the next day, my videos will never be a DIY. This is how you do this. Start at step one and it completes to step 10. No, my videos are for you guys that are technicians that want to learn. I don't care if homeowners or business owners want to watch these. So that way, and I do get some interesting feedback. I get people saying, man, I really like the level of quality you put into it. And then they ask me questions. My contractor told me this and I say, yeah, that sounds very fair. What he said. Okay. So it, it, it's good for business owners and stuff to watch these because they get to see what we actually go through and how hard we have to work. But my videos will never be a DIY show you from step one to step 10. No, not what my stuff's going to be. So, okay, guys. Uh, Isaac. Guys, I'm going to post this for Isaac in here so that way he can see. Hold on. Isaac is the username deaf HVACR SoCal. And he is actually deaf. So um, I'm going to post this for him. It's the redfish IDVM 550. So um, Isaac watches these. He can't hear what's going on. He can watch my videos via subtitles. He's a technician here in my area. But he can um, uh, he watches the live stream and watches the chat. And then he kind of gets from them. So he's a really cool guy. Uh, right on Pablo. I appreciate it, man. I'm doing great guys. Uh, Jim, Tom, how old was I when I began running my business? Um, so I work with my father. I have worked with my father since I was a little kid. I officially started in 2002 as a service tech and learned from there. I already had basic skills because I grew up working for him, but it was official in 2002. I would say that we partnered. I mean, it's hard to say the exact day that we partnered, but we officially partnered probably, eight years ago. Yeah. Was when we officially partnered. 
So um, I run it with him. Uh, my my position in the company is, um, and my dad's goal is to retire eventually. Honestly, I don't want him to retire, but re- he doesn't work anymore. Uh, he comes in the office and works in the office uh, five days a week. Um, but so basically he handles the office. Um, I consult on some of that stuff. I go in the office one to two days a week. I train. I'm the field manager, service manager. That's my technical role. Um, but I am officially half owner in the company. And, but I don't, you know, I don't handle the insurance and the workers comp and all that stuff. I hear about it, but it just kind of goes in one ear and out the other. And I focus more on the company. We kind of do this in, in as a team. So, um, but yeah, eight, eight, nine years ago is when we officially partnered. So, okay. Yes. And, and that's fine. Mark Smith. There's absolutely nothing wrong with watching my videos. So, um, yeah, cool. Symptoms of non-condensables in the system. Well, Ralph Halili, is that how you say your name? Um, there's a couple different methods on that. Obviously, um, you know, you've got a liquid line sight glass that's going to tell you if you have moisture in the system. That's a non-condensable, right? Um, you know, you've got uh, filter dryers that are going to plug up. So non-condensables can plug up the filter dryers. Um, you can do a pressure test, you know, a standing pressure test where you shut the system off leave the condenser fan motor and the evaporator fan motor running, let the temperatures in the evaporator and the condenser equalize out. And you can uh, check the refrigerant to a pressure temperature chart to verify if it has the right refrigerant or possibly has non-condensables in the system. Um, There's a couple different things that non-condensables can cause. So uh, vital signs are really going to help you out. Okay. Um, Yeah, we could talk about that more too. You can send me an email maybe and I can address that some more. So, um, what is it I'm doing when I stick my screwdriver underneath the pressure control bellows? I see that often in my videos. Okay, Dean. So underneath on the, the Johnson control pressure controls, and I don't have one right here handy, but on the Johnson control pressure controls, underneath the bellows, if you very carefully, and it's, it's, it's an approved method if you read on the pressure control, you can stick a screwdriver on there, and there's a little spot for a screwdriver. And what I'm doing is I'm simulating high pressure pushing up on the bellows. So you essentially are just popping it up like the high pressure in the capillary tube is pushing it up. So I'm just basically, you can put it under there and leave it in there and the system will never shut off on low pressure. So I'm simulating high pressure or higher, high enough pressure in the low side to push the pressure control on is what I'm doing. So I will do that if I'm testing, if I'm pumping down a system, I'll put it in there so that way I can get it down to zero PSI. Or if I'm testing a suction service valve, you know, I can pump the system down and pull it into a vacuum and test how fast it rises. That's another method too. So, but yes, I'm testing the bellows underneath it. Um, okay. Let's see. When looking at potential employees, any certs or licenses preferred? Uh, the more certs, the better for an employee. This is a reefer tech mark that asked me this. The more certs, the better. But um, I'm not going to hire someone because they don't have certs. If their personality's right and they seem like a mechanically inclined person, um, but if they have, you know, general Nate certs, any kind of continuing education that they can show me if they're an RSCS CM member, that's like a, if you can hire someone that's CM or CMS and RSCS, I, any certification out there, basic, okay, so in a nutshell, um, long time ago, all the manufacturers came out when they were creating Nate, right? That was created by all the manufacturers. They came together and they said, we need one way of certification. Um, we need an industry standard certification amongst the industry. So that's why they came up with Nate. Nate was the one that they were going to go with, right? So everybody backed it and then Nate company was formed and then they created Nate. Well, once they decided they were going to go with, um, with Nate, they went to RSCS and they said, Hey, we want you to write us an exam because RSCS had been around and they were a training organization and they basically RCS has had their CM exam for years, right? Uh, certificate member examination, or there's the certificate member specialist. Well, the RCS CM is too hard. All right. The Nate test is designed so that someone who's been in the industry for so many years can pass the test without studying the RCS test. No, if you have an RCS CM, you know, your shit, pardon my French, but you do. Okay. And the, the interesting thing about the RSCS CM test is, is you have to pass all the categories at once. So you don't get to just take the core and then take the gas heat and then the oil. No, you're taking, you're taking general when you're taking the CM. And then the specialist is when you, so you get your CM certification, but then if you want your CMS, then you grind down into the nitty gritties about a CM, you know, the specialist test that you're going to take. So, um, if you, if someone had an RSCS CM, they would be a top of the list candidate. 
for uh i don't even have an rcs cm uh, because it's not because i can't take the i can't pass the test i've never studied for it so i've taken the test two times and i've never studied uh and i'm going to tell you guys to be honest with you i'm not trying to brag or anything but i've, I've got the ac heat pump nate test and i've got the light commercial refrigeration nate test or certification and i never studied for any one of those i just sat down and took the test and passed it but i sat down and tried to take the rscs cm test and it handed my ass to me basically i didn't pass that one without studying so it's just a matter of me being lazy and not studying to pass the test but so, um, but here in Southern California, you don't have to have any licenses besides your EPA 608 certification. Other than that, any certifications that someone can show me, um, they're going to, you know, make me uh, consider them more. I, I appreciate anything that shows that you're interested in your education and interested in furthering yourself. Um, right on. Okay. Let's see what else I'm missing here. Do I care about CEFSA certifications? Ralph Go Ruff, Rafael Gomez. CEFSA is a great certification program. Um, I looked into it as a service company, but it's just too expensive and it's not beneficial enough for me as a service company because I don't need any more work. And that's one of the things that CEFSA gives you is by being a CEFSA certified company, you can work, you know, certain companies only work with them and different things. And I don't need the work. Um, I'd be interested in the certifications for sure. But it's just the cost and stuff. It just wasn't justifiable for me to do that. But no, CEFSA is great. I, I have no problem. Any certification is better than none. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, Jason Arnett, if I had them, I'll try to maybe in another live stream, I'll put some certifications up and I'll put links in there. I don't have them handy right now. Um, but I, I definitely think that if you guys have uh, anything here, rses.org is probably one of the best things that I think you can get involved in. Um, even if you don't have a local chapter in your area, just Google, just copy. I don't know why that didn't pop as a link. www.rses.org. Huh. Maybe it's because it's a .org. It's not popping up as a link on my side. Um, but yeah, rses.org, uh, you can find local chapters. That's a great, great, great education stuff okay even if you don't have an active chapter in your area um the the getting access to their website and the sam manuals and the training they have is great uh if any of you guys are in the southern california area or you know anybody in the southern california area we have probably the two most active chapters in majority if not two of the i mean in the majority of the united states we have the long beach chapter which is about 35 miles from me, okay? And we have the Arrowhead chapter, which is my chapter, which is in, we have our meetings at San Bernardino Valley College um, and uh, right there off of Mount Vernon and uh, Colton. Um, so we do our meetings the second Tuesday of every month. Uh, I'm an active member in my chapter. I'm on the board. I'm technically the, SAR no, I'm the secretary. So I handle like communications and different things, but I do training classes myself quite often, and then we also have other members that do training classes. Um, our classes are the second Tuesday of every month at 6 o'clock p.m. We give you free dinner. We usually have pizza and drinks for free, and you don't have to be a member to come to the classes. If you choose to join, that's that's on you, but you don't have to be a member. You can come, and you can keep coming. Just come check out what we have to offer. So if anybody that's local, come check out our meetings, second Tuesday of every month at San Bernardino Valley College. So, um, Okay. Yeah, exactly. We're like an HVAC biker gang, Bill Burnett. That's exactly what we are, dude. We're, we're patch carrying members, you know? So, and you got to get patched in too. So you got to know how to install a TXV. And then uh, the, the, the task to get patched in too is you got to grab a discharge line on a 110 degree day with your, your hands. You got to keep it on there for five minutes and then you can become a member. So, um, yeah, supply houses offer various classes and different things too. So, Oh, that's funny, Jeff. It just said, yeah. Um, okay. Let's see what else I got going on here. Yeah, there you go. Bill Burnett, there's actually active members. There's an RSCS. Um, it's kind of like a sister organization already active in Canada, dude. You should look it up. They're technically part of us, but they're technically not. So it's like a whole thing, but they're active in Canada. So they're already there, man. All right. Um, okay. So, uh, let's go into another question that I had that I have on my list of stuff right here. Most reliable ice machine. Okay. Someone asked me, what's the most reliable ice machine out there? 
That's a really hard one. Okay. If you have a service company that you trust and that you use already, you need to lean on that service company and ask them which ice machine they're comfortable with. Okay. A lot of the ice machine manufacturers out there, they all have their own little method. I mean, ice machines all work with the same principle, but they usually have a different method of defrosting and harvesting the ice. That's, that's really what breaks down an ice machine. Okay. It's just different methods of control systems too. So I'm very, very comfortable with Manitowoc ice machines, Hoshizaki ice machines, and uh, Follett ice machines. Um, I, I'm confident that I can work on a Scotsman and an Isomatic and a Vote ice machine. But um, other than that, I really don't know much about the other ice machines. Okay, So if I was to recommend an ice machine, it's mainly because I'm very confident in working on them is a Hoshizaki or a Manitowoc. Okay? And then depending on the situation, a Follett ice machine. Um, so it's really all about what your contractor is comfortable at working on. Okay. The, every ice machine is going to break. They all have their quirks. And the number one problem with every ice machine out there is water, 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 water is the ice machine's worst enemy. Right. But the irony is, is that you need water to make ice. So go figure. Um, let's see. Joaquin Perez, Manitowoc has an error code for sensing probe. You do regular maintenance. And after you put into ice mode and drops the ice multiple times, would you still replace the sensing probe? Plate was frozen. Um, so are you talking about the ice thickness sensing probe? If it's the ice thickness sensing probe, there's a couple things going on with that, Joaquin. Uh, it could be, it depends on if it's an indigo machine. I'm assuming it's an indigo. Uh, it could be, uh, it's technically a, a microphone if that's what you're talking about. Um, I, I don't know. I need some more context on that one, Joaquin, because it also can have a lot to do with the cleaners that you're using to clean them. And if you're submersing the probes 100% in cleaner, sometimes they can mess with the probes too. So give me some more context on your question there, bud. Um, do I have a chapter in New York, Raphael? Uh, I don't know if there's a chapter in New York. Um, there probably is. Just go to rscs.org and then there's a thing that says chapters. Find a chapter or whatever. Um, okay. Yeah, exactly. Scott. Scott said, clean it. Hoshizaki tops than Manny. Worst is Scotsman. You know, Brian, I would probably agree with that. And again, I'm going to say it's because of preference. I know some guys that swear by Scotsman machines and hate Hoshis and Manny's. So, you know, and that's, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to go there. I was going to say something controversial, but no. Okay. Um, bubbles in a sight glass when pressures are good. That was another question that I had. Someone said, hey, if I have good pressures, but I still have bubbles in my sight glass, what does that mean? That's like a whole podcast topic in itself, right? Okay, so sight glass. Sight glass is a window into the system at that point in the system, right? So if a sight glass is downstairs just before the expansion valve, that means that just before the expansion valve, there's uh, not 100% liquid going to that, that expansion valve, okay? If it's on the roof, it means the same thing at that point in the system. So you have to understand that just because you have a sight glass doesn't mean that... Um, it's necessarily short on charge or something too. Okay. And we're talking about refrigeration systems, not air conditioning. Okay. So the theory behind an expansion valve is, is that we need solid column of liquid going to the expansion valve at all time. Right. Um, because that's the way an expansion valve works. We need to have that pressure differential across the valve. We feed liquid into it. It's designed to create a pressure drop. And then the refrigerant comes out the other side as a vapor liquid mixture. Right. And then it boils off in the evaporator and moves on up to the condenser. Okay. Um, absorbs heat and all that fancy stuff. But the question that he sent me was pressures are okay, but sight glass is flashing. Okay. What does he mean by pressures are okay? And I'm not knocking you for sending you, sending me the question. Okay. I'm just saying you need to stop and not really look at the pressure so much. Pressures do matter, but you need to have that solemn column of solid column of liquid go into your expansion valve for it to work properly. Okay. Um, when someone says that the pressure seem okay, I always ask them in context to what, I mean, are you talking that your liquid saturation temperature? I mean, you need to look at the temperatures more so than the pressures. And we need to know about the proper TD temperature differential across, uh, you know, from the, the outside air and then the air being discharged out of the top of the condenser. That would be a condenser TD. Okay. Um, or I'm sorry, uh, the refrigerant temperature and the outside, outside air. Okay. We need, and then the same thing on an evaporator, the temperature differential or the TD on a, a walk-in cooler evaporator is the return air versus the, the refrigerant temperature inside the evaporator. So you need to understand how refrigerant temperatures work, um, and what temperature your evaporator and your condenser should be. When you say that you have a flashing sight glass, but your pressures are okay. I, 
I start to think that maybe you don't quite understand how a sight glass works. And I'm not trying to knock you. I mean, everybody needs to learn. Honestly, I don't remember your name because you sent me a question, but I'm just telling you. You need to have a solid column of liquid go into your expansion valve at all times, and then your pressures get adjusted after that, okay? You look at, you you you, you clear that sight glass, but again, you need to make sure that you don't have a, a kinked liquid line before that sight glass. You don't have something that's causing the refrigerant to flash before the sight glass. So you can't just look at it and say, clear the sight glass and move on. You have to understand how the system works. So. Um, for the guy that sent me that question, send me an email and we can talk about it some more. So, um, okay, let's see what else is going on here. What am I missing here? Okay. Uh, I don't see any more questions popping up. Remember guys. Yeah, we're still live. If you guys have more questions, put them in caps lock so I can get to them. Okay. Um, oh, cool. Right on true sim senpai. I appreciate it, man. Uh, so guys put, uh, Yes, they do. Refrigerant blends, as as Ralph from Honeywell, he's a Dallas fan, he says refrigerant blends make using a sight glass even trickier. That is the truth. You have to understand glide in a system, and you have to be careful about it. And, uh, be, yeah, there's a, there's a whole thing about blends and different things. It's it's a whole big, messy situation. So, um, Headphone, this is one I want to cover, guys. Very, very important. A rant that I kind of went off on on my video that I released today. Headphones when you're working. I like to listen to music just as much as the next guy. But when I am working, I'm there to work. My personal opinion, not judging you for doing it, but I'm just telling you, my personal opinion is, is that we shouldn't be wearing headphones when we are working. It's one thing to have ear protection on if you're working in a loud environment. That's totally justified. But if you're working outside on a PM, doing a PM, it's really easy to throw headphones on because it's a boring, monotonous job, right? But in the video that I just released, this today, I went there to work on one system, and while I was working on it, I had the panels on the, 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 the unit and I could hear a compressor running hard and I investigated and found that the unit had a bad condenser fan motor. The customer did not even know yet. So I was going to leave and go home, but I heard the noise and I changed that other condenser fan motor too. Okay. It really helps to be vigilant when we're on a job as a business owner. I don't appreciate people wearing headphones because I'm paying them to do a job and they're on site. They're doing a preventative maintenance. They're working on stuff and they're getting paid. They need to be listening and doing their job and and fixing things properly and being vigilant and listening and keeping the customer's best interests at heart. So when you have headphones on, in my opinion, it creates a problem. It's also a safety issue, okay? Last thing you want is for there's a fire in the building. I mean, no, that sounds crazy, right? But last thing you want to hear is the fire alarm or you don't hear the fire alarm and you're standing there on the roof, you know, and you don't even know that there's a fire in the building or something like that, okay? Um, electrical stuff going on behind you, different things. So you need to have your wits about you when you're working. Personal opinion, not judging you, but just, you know, I, I, I don't really appreciate people using headphones when they're working. I'm not saying that I don't ever, you know, uh, when I'm doing high, heavy construction jobs or install jobs, sometimes I'll bring a, a job site radio up on the roof, but I can still hear things around me. I'm not going to put headphones on to where I can't hear anything. So rant over, okay? Uh, let's see what else I missed here. Replace Dixel control or convert to conventional if unit is out of warranty. Um, Andrew Karchner, uh, I'm a big fan of using OEM parts, okay? Uh, there is instances where I'm not going to go back in with OEM, but I'm not going to just send someone out there that doesn't understand what they're doing to do it. Um, so it, I'll give you an example. I have a customer that constantly shorts out electronic temperature controllers. And... Um, as a business owner, in the very beginning, it was a warranty stuff. I went to the warranty manufacturer and I said, look, I can solve your guys' problems if you let me move the temperature controller. And uh, they said, sure, go ahead and move it. And I moved it and I think the job took three hours. It took an hour over what the warranty guidelines said and they didn't pay me for that extra hour. So that was the absolute last time on a warranty job that I looked out for the warranty company's best interest. Okay. Uh, they didn't pay me for that hour. I was done. I wasn't going to fight it or anything. I just ate it and I moved on and I'm not, I'm not bending over backwards for a warranty contractor. I'm not going to solve their problems. It's their box. They engineered it. Kind of the same thing goes for the customers. I, I, I try to look out for my customer's best interests and occasionally I'll bring stuff up to certain customers, but I also have other customers that I know they just want it cheapest and fastest. So I just put back in what belongs in the box and move on and just do about my thing. Okay. If it's the perfect customer that honestly wants to pay me for my time and wants me to give them my opinion and try to solve problems, then yes, sometimes I will put a non-factory controller in there 
that will do just the same, or it's programmed differently, or I might move the control to a different location. I hope that answers your question, Andrew. So, um, okay, how often do you see a sight glass in the box near the evaporator? Andrew, you asked me that question almost never, buddy. Um, I can probably think of two times in my head where a sight glass was actually installed near the expansion valve. And the, uh, the, the liquid line filter dryer was installed right next to the expansion valve too, and I'm going to be honest with you, it was a big pain in the butt because it was a big hospital and they had a giant uh, industrial walk-in evaporator and uh, I pumped the system down but there was still vapor boiling out of the evaporator so it was really hard to uh, change the liquid line filter dryer because there was still pressure in it so it's very rare that you actually see a sight glass near the expansion valve which if you guys don't already know that's where a sight glass is technically supposed to be so um, okay guys we're kind of wrapping it up here because we're getting towards the end of the time um, you guys if I'm not answering questions or anything you guys can feel free to send me an email and we might hit them on the next live stream. Um, uh -huh. Raymond 1230. That is such a hard question, dude. The customer needs to convert it to POE oil, man. There's all kinds of, all kinds of um, methods out there, man. But the only way to do it absolutely right is to convert it to POE oil. There is refrigerants that work kind of good, but if you have, there's so many, so many problems but ralph can probably answer a little bit better maybe he's got a, a one-stop solution there but um guys i'm gonna put ralph's email address in here if you guys want to send him emails ralph is a real good guy he's always active in the chat he's always here answering questions for people too so i'm gonna put it in here if you guys want to email ralph you can email him he is dallas fan here's ralph's email address and he can probably help you guys out a little bit more okay um there you go bill popped up right now you should see it so how is it worth putting that much time okay um okie dokie guys uh that's pretty much it that's really all i got guys so if anybody has any last minute questions throw them in caps right now but if not we're going to be wrapping this up so i'll give you guys another couple minutes to throw some last minute questions and uh we're probably going to be stopping this thing here in just a minute so let me see if anything else pops up uh yeah superior take my blood pressure pills yeah i probably need a chill pill dude i shouldn't be drinking the espresso roast coffee that i drink the two cups that i drink every morning because i don't need that especially when i get in a car and start driving uh jrm asked me about the redfish meter so yeah i i have it I haven't used it yet but i'm gonna so hey wait hang on just a second uh uh, Renegade Randy Riker, you said Drain the Swamp. Are you a John and Ken listener? Drain the Swamp is a, there's a local conservative radio station here and they're on KFI and that one of their things is Drain the Swamp. It's get rid of all the drama. I'm curious if you meant that. Ralph, thank you so very much, man. I really appreciate it, bud. Uh, thanks for the heads up on the Spoiling TXV kit in the process of building one. Right on, Cody. That's great, man. That Spoiling kit is awesome. And the guy that won it is, uh, shoot, I don't have his name, but I just shipped it off to him. He's in upstate New York. Um, just shipped it to him. So, uh, have I come across any equipment doing carbon dioxide as a refrigerant? No, no. I want you to put the caps there. Uh, UXW bill that's helping me remember or get to your comment. Um, I have not worked on anything CO2, but yes, I have seen him. A lot of the Coke, uh, dispenser refrigerators, like little tiny throwaway refrigerators, they have CO2 in them. Um, so I have not worked on one, but I have seen them. So in the restaurants that I'm at, so, um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Bill, I'm going to be closing this up too. So, um, how does my on call work? Do you guys run full week at a time? Do you need two guys with what you guys do? Okay. Will Fonder, I am going to cover that. That's a really good one. Um, if, if people are interested in what I'm about to tell you guys, you can send me an email at hvacrvideos at gmail.com. I'm going to type it in the chat. Gmail.com. I think that's my email address. Yep, I typed it right. Okay, so here's how my on-call schedule works. And this is a pretty interesting way. We used to do one week at a time, but we don't anymore, okay? So the way that it works is we have one technician that covers Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And all of our other technicians each get a day during the week. Okay. So when it's technically your on call weekend, you're only on call Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Then we have a rotating schedule. So you never get the same day every week. Okay. 
So um, the way that it works is, is the guy that's on call, like for instance, I'm on call this week, this weekend. Okay. So I'm on call Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night. I am automatically on call next Thursday. And then my, I, every day I go back one day until it's my turn to be on call on the weekend again. And you can do that with a rotating group. So I have a five week rotation. Technically I have five, wait, hold on. I got to count how many employees I have. I have a five week rotation and I have myself. I have four technicians in my rotation right now and I have an apprentice that I'm going to put into the rotation eventually. Okay. So I technically take two official calls and then I have one guy that I back up on his calls too. So I'm on call three, three times in a row basically. But, but so that's how my call rotation works. Every technician gets one weekend, right? Or there's always one technician on the weekend and then the other technicians fill the rest of the days. So our weekend is Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then we do a rotating. So that way in the middle of the summer when it's super, super hot, you're not working a crazy busy normal day and then working every night that day, that week either. Okay. It, it breaks it up and helps everybody. I think it really, really helps us. And then it's just a rotating schedule. So hopefully that makes sense to you guys. Okay. Oh, right on. Okay. Justin. Yeah. It works really well. So, um, yeah, exactly. Hopefully that makes sense to you guys. Yeah. So I don't do the seven days anymore, Bill. I used to do it, but it just, yeah. Um, young mafia, bud, you're going to need to send me an email. I'll, I'll, I'll answer that a little bit more. Okay. Um, gentlemen, I am going to wrap this up because we are coming up on an hour and a half right now. So I really appreciate or gentlemen and ladies, I should say, I don't know if there's any girls in here. I really appreciate everybody in here. I'm super stoked with the giant crowd of people. We had like a hundred and almost 30 people at one point. We're at 116 right now. I really appreciate the, uh, the, you guys watching my videos and all this stuff, send me emails, send me feedback. I really appreciate the comments. I read every comment, try to answer as many as I can. Okay. Thanks so much. And, uh, we're going to go ahead and, um, transition on over here. If I can figure out how to change that over and change that back. And I will see you guys next week.